Before we start, the idea for this, this meeting was a dialogue. <laughs> dialogue is a good communication um, between a designer, a professional designer, and a fabricator. So these are the stories that happen. And all of the examples, nobody in this room, it's your job. Oh, no. No, not mm -hmm. But we have had an experience like this. This is more educational to make folks aware that that is kind of dangerous. I should put some best practices in place. We'd also like you folks to engage, you're like, hey, let me see if I understand what you're, you're showing us as best practice so I can take it, back, take it back to my company. Other fabricators in the room, please, if you have a different opinion, feel free to state your different opinion or a designer having a different opinion, how you would approach it. This is how all of us to educate one another. <coughs> oh, sorry. It's <coughs> all for us to help become better and use best practices. So these are our stories. Yeah, um, like Jerry said, there, there are stories and we're going to engage with you guys as we try to answer each other's questions in different locations uh, and on the fly. So we're going to have some fun with it and uh, we're winging it, we're freestyling it. So let's have, it. Let's have some fun, okay? Scenario number one. <clears throat> so, in this particular case, in this scenario, ring, ring, hey, Jerry. Hey, Seth, what's going on? <laughs> hey, I, you know, I sent over my uh, fab document and, and my data, and, uh, you know, what, what's, a, what's the pushback? I, I don't understand why I'm getting some issues. What? I, I'm getting TQs. I, I don't understand what the problem is. Can you elaborate? Um, what uh, data do you are you talking about? Are you talking about the data you gave us when you placed the order? Well, uh, well, we sent you the data the first time. Remember when I first asked yeah, you yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we got the order, we got the PO, and we started working on it. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that our supply chain sent you the original data that we were supposed to quote on. I mean, I mean that never happens where supply chain sends data. Were you, really are you saying this was preliminary data? <laughs> well, well, yeah, you should have the final document. You have all the final data. No, no, no. We've been, when we received your PO and your data, it didn't say preliminary. We've been working on it for the last two weeks. Um, is that not the last revision what, what, that we released here? What rev do you have? Because we, we released, I, I think it's we released you know, rev two. Well, the PO and the drawing you sent us all match, so we would have just gotten started. But b before I left on vacation, I told you, I mean, that doesn't happen when you guys just hand, you know, the rush to get something done, am I right? I mean, it never happens. Yeah, that was the three-day weekend, right? Everybody's getting out the door Friday. <laughs> but you told me you had the right data. I mean, I know, but once we got a PO and your data, we place your data in a directory, and we, we match it to a design. And once the PO comes in, we just start, we take that data from that directory and run with it. So, end of scenario. So, has this ever happened to anybody? Where they've sent preliminary data, and then, and the thing is, when you look at these things, it seems like an innocent accident. But there are tens of thousands of dollars. There may be a product demonstration that you're now gonna miss the window, and you're not gonna have functional product. You've got a trade show, some military or the DO, Department of Defense is showing up, because, We've been working on the wrong data for two, two weeks. This, this, this scenario happens a lot. When I've gone through a lot of these scenarios, my people, oh yeah, tell them this one. So, a good practice, and there's another part to this, is to simply put like a watercolor or a, a, a tone cross saying preliminary data. So if you know you're sending it, you're just quoting it and getting it in place, especially when you have new people that are in purchasing and engineering is trying to speed up things, it's a good idea to just put preliminary across the drawing. But there's another side of that coin. We're not going to build it if it says preliminary across the drawing because for military folks, they have oh, source inspectors. And if they see a drawing that says preliminary, they go, I am not going to source this. 
They will yeah. simply just walk out of the building and, oh, we were trying to count on those dollars for this month for shipping. Yes. I would, I would tell you, from, uh, after the last 13 years in Millero, we had uh, a third party vendor who was our first article inspection. And if our drawing didn't match, even though that stuff is on the docks, engineering can't touch it or fat manufacturing can't get a hold of it. And it is a nightmare to deal with, especially if you have to make an engineering change, which we'll get into another scenario. I mean, an engineering change on a drawing, simple a typo, could cost up to $20,000, simply because of the process. Because it has to be approved by a whole group of people. Oh my God. And if it's military, a lot of times it goes to a different military prime, and they gotta contractually get them to agree to it. And so this whole process takes literally just a wrong typo on a dimension will take $20,000 as it goes up and down the chain to get everything signed off with the right rep. The problem is, we can't just redline the dimension because the source inspector says, no, I can't accept that. I need a drawing that has the right number. So this is kind of sharing with you best practice and make sure that you've checked all your dimensions and stuff. But if it's preliminary, just write across and let us know it's preliminary. We don't know. As soon as it's the PO, we're off to the races to be on time and on schedule. And I, was, I would tell you, Follow your internal processes, don't, don't shortcut them because it will bite you and that's a, here's a perfect example. So, next scenario, this is one of our, my favorite ones. Ring, 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 hey Jerry. Hello. In other words, Abbott, I need help, I need help. What, hey, what, what, what's going know, on? What's... I, I gotta make a change and I know you promised me a short, you know, three day delivery or five day delivery. But I gotta make a change, so. What do you need to you know, change? I gotta change layer three. Um, there's, there's some impedance and some traces that are screwed up, and I had to make some switches. I'm gonna, I'm gonna so, send you updated uh, oh, layer three, oh, or okay. what do you need, the whole thing, or? No, 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 it's already been tooled. I can just change the core. Just send me the one layer. Do oh. not send me the entire <laughs> oh. database, because it takes sometimes two to six hours to go through your data, so just, just send me the one layer. Okay, hold on, yeah, hold on. Hey, can we just get the one layer? Can we just do that? Is that, that all right? Just go ahead and just fabricate the one layer or just generate that and give that to them. Oh, okay. Hey, Jerry, yeah, I can have my team do that. I'll get that over to you. That'll only take like five minutes to fix. Thanks, just send the one layer. So what do I do? Yes. I send him the whole database. <laughs> Why? Because <clears throat> as engineers, we want to make changes because if we open the door for one thing, well, let's just change this and this other thing and this other thing but I didn't tell him. So I send him the whole data. This is and then, the even worse, I send him three sets of data. I send him the Gerber data, I send him ODP++, and I send him 2581. And guess what? The ODP++ doesn't match the other two. So, hey. So I give him that data. I looked at the data. They sent the whole thing. Oh. I don't trust him. Right? If Jerry's that guy changed picture. something, did something wrong and on the previous release didn't tell anybody in his company that, oops, I forgot to change the solder mass clearance for these capacitors because we wanted to change that. Oh, the new data? I'll slip in those other layers now, unbeknownst to everybody, and I'll be off the hook because no one's ever going to see that it's bad. So, as a fabricator, I have in the past go, okay, they said just layer two, I'm just changing layer two, I'm not changing other layers. Then they get the board and said, oh, this. The solder mass clearances on the capacitors were changed too. No, 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 I got the original data. No, no, we sent you new data. No, no, you sent just layer two. You just sent layer two. We, we agreed to just do layer two, and... I, but, but we made a change, and we but, should be able to deal with that. I mean... We could, but okay, so now I have to start all over, do a new tool number, charge you for NRE again. No, but you can't. I mean, I'm Mill Arrow, you know how much it's going to cost me? And I don't have the time to do it. I hope it costs us to tool up a job and then start over and tool another now, system. He's my guy. He'll take care of it. He's my guy. Come on, Jerry. Man. I, I, you know, we've done, done it before. I mean, we've built the up. We didn't use the other layers. So yeah, how come? Well, the other fabricator does that for me. Why don't you hook me up, man? Well, that means we have to start all over. And we're going to lose all that time in the day. Because to change one layer, run DRC on one layer is only five minutes. Hey, I promise you, you'll get a bigger PO next time. <laughs> so, the other part of the story, the other part of the story is that if we just change the one layer and they come back contractually said, on these finished boards, 
did you use all of the new data? Even though he told me, this is just layer two, and we go, no, we used the original one and just switched the layer. I go, that's not what the PO says. The PO requires that you use the entire database that we sent you, and you're all of a sudden tens of thousands of dollars out and having to remake, you're late, your scorecard gets hit. These scenarios happen. So if you can't live with just switching out one layer, because your internal process is to send a complete set. Understand that we're going to ask you to pay for another NRE because we've invested four or six hours in a job, we got all the data set up, we planned the whole thing, and now we have to start over. We don't trust the notes that were there before, that they're the same notes now. And I got burned. It's like nothing's changed. It's the same board. It's exactly the same. We don't change anything, do we? Come on. Page eight had an array that just moved it 100 mils. The board's the same, the array's different, and scrap the whole entire thing because the pitch was wrong. So when you ask us to start over and you send us an entire database, you're gonna be per pretty much be asked, we don't always win. But we ask <laughs> for an another NRE and a restart date because it has to start from scratch because we can't trust that everything in the print, word for word, paragraph for paragraph match. They could have changed something, and if you trust it, I have been <laughs> and guess who's paying for the material that just got wasted? We are. Oh, oh you're Billy? Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in Mill Arrow, we pay for everything. So, <laughs> and it's different between military customers and commercial customers. We're commercial customers. Here's one layer. We just go, we're like, ah, it's fine, we're on our way. And we're used to it. When you get with commercial, commercial customer, military customer, like, no, I don't trust them. They could have changed anything in that design. They sent me the whole thing. I'm going to start over because I don't trust them. Because our process says to generate all these files, even though our process is 30 years old, it still says to generate these so, files. So how many folks, when they want to make a change, they send the entire database or just the one layer? The entire database. The entire database. It's safer. It's absolutely safer. And we have to, to be safe. We start from scratch. Just disregard everything else because we might miss something. All right, the next one. You guys enjoying this, by the way? Just, yeah. just yeah. This is, this is like, we're, we're winging this. Right? Yeah. Just do this for the first time. This is our first idea for this. Go. All right. Oh. Hey. Ring, 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 ring. Hey, Jerry. 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 Hello. Hello. Jerry. Yes. Hey. Yes. What's taking so long, dude? You know, you promised me three days on this turn. You know, I, I don't understand. And, and oh. then the thing I'm, I'm, I don't get is that why are we getting, why are we getting, like, partial delivery? And, I mean, we're supposed to get 50 a pop, and instead we're getting, like, 10. Maybe 11 pieces, and well, I, I don't I, understand. I, I think what this is is the longer lead time to build your board. So oh, come on, man. I mean, well, we, well, we, only you from, we only went from six layers to 18. It, well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> but, but you also went from a, from you, you changed jobs where they did one lamb cycle jobs with no HDI to somebody's doing multiple lamination cycles. Jerry, and, and they're not the same. So dog, come on, come on, dog. I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean. The other let, supplier, let, Jerry, my other supplier hooks it up. Was it the sales <laughs> right? So, but let, let me explain. When we were building your boards at your previous place you worked at, there were one lamination cycle jobs, which about basically 22 process steps to do one lamp cycle, drill through, plate, etch, solder mask, legend, route and done. It's, it's, is it's not that, that many process steps. Is this that thing you were explaining to you the last time I, I walked to your shop a lot of years ago? Yeah, years ago. so I showed you all that equipment. Oh, it was five so, years ago. Oh. But your design now with your HDI and your 18 layers, it requires a lot more process steps, but that's just the first lamp cycle. Okay. Then we have all of the additional lamp cycles, so these things run into 120, 150 process steps when it used to be 22 to 28. So. Each process step, so far as processing and time. Am I going to get it tomorrow? Oh, I mean, no. <laughs> what, what are you telling me? Well, we have all the process steps. We've marked it out. We, we track all that stuff. And we're projecting a 20-day turn for this board. Well, that doesn't include, that doesn't include what we get. So it's just the work days. So you know, but my, my supply chain said you can do it in three days. I don't understand. No. There's two things I never give out as the technical person. How much does it cost? And when are you getting it? So, so this is one of my presentations that I gave because we had customers, we used to get boards done, we used to do them in 24 hours. Yeah, we used to do them in 24 hours, but there was no epoxy fill, there was no laser, there was no sublamination. You didn't have back drills I had to fill afterwards. 
all of those process steps, the checks involved in them, they just start mounting higher and higher. And I think the highest board I ever saw was it had 595 manufacturing steps. Who got fired? Exactly. So what happened was you have to be good for 595 process steps. Doesn't always happen. Now I'll give you another story. I had a customer, really good guy, subject matter expert, one of the highest in the IPC, love Joey. He comes in to visit us. We have like five lamination cycles. He goes, what's your yield? And we just run our yield. We get it like in seconds. He goes, 70% yield, very good, very good. Finally, somebody gets it. Because I'm like, why aren't you getting 95% on this one lamp cycle job? I used to get like 95%. No, every sub lamination, my conservative number, just to plan for worst case scenario, lose 10% every sub. 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, all of a sudden you're at 50, 60, 70%. You go, yeah, that's, that's kind of what it is. When we're on our game, when the design is good, we can take something, and this literally happened, I think it's a scenario, five lamination cycles, badly designed, and it's some of the scenarios we show you. It was 25% yield. So we were charging them the next order 4X. I think, well, what's this? The price went up. Like, well, we're throwing away three, every third one out of four. So we looked at the design and changed it, and we'll go through the scenario. It went to 88% yield. Same lamp cycles, same component placement. They just followed the rules. Well, no, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, what's your name? Jenny. Jenny. Jenny Brown. You should have been caught in the coding stage. No. We on a good month in our factories that have high capture rate, it's 30%. The DRC time's about anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours. And that's before you start documenting problems. If it's clean, you don't have enough to document. If it's dirt messy, you're writing up everything wrong. We are not, we don't have the bandwidth to go and evaluate the 70% we're losing. So no, it's not a quote. A quote is just basically taking your numbers off your print and then to get a quote, we'll find the rest of it later. But that's where we need the designers follow rules and good guidelines so there won't be questions later on and the design will go smoothly and, and get the higher I, I, I would tell you, in the end, uh, as designers, we need to understand this and convey this, this type of process when we're within our stakeholders at the beginning of our projects. Because to be honest with you, a project manager doesn't care about this. He wants to know how quick is the design going to be done to meet his schedule. That's all they care about, to be honest with you, at least from my point of view. After 30 years, the project manager has no idea most of the time of what the, how, many, how long your designs will take to get fabricated. All he wants is his three or five day turn or seven day turn. So that, understanding this is to convey what Jerry is saying to your team is paramount. So that worst case scenario, 595 process steps, I went back and looked at the design. They had like two subs for two holes that were power to a chip on one side. Why don't you just drill all the way through? It was just power, it's no impedance. But they had these extra lamination cycles for the bottom side. The point is like, this is insane. So we got it down to 300 process steps. Probably could have got it down into the low 250, uh, below 250, and finally got boards delivered. So just these are kind of the things to share. Now, thank you for sharing. Um, this next one's my favorite. Go. Oh, okay. Ring, ring, ring. Hey, Jerry. Yes. Hey, uh, you know what? I'm really running late on this design. Dude. I want to know if you hook up and do me a DFM report on my design. I'll get you over the data. Do a DFM check for me. Just check for major things if you can, and then uh, let me know what you find. I mean, let, let's be real. We, we never, we always have time to do DFM stuff and analysis. We never shortcut anything. So, Jerry, can, can you hook me up, man? I, I, I'm really swamped here. So, so we're friends, Steph. So I'm gonna just be very plain. Very, Come very on, dog. Free. I mean, all right. I, I'll do it, but. Let me see if I understand this right. Hey, this, this, time, this time the bear's on me. I, 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 yeah, okay, I'll take it. I'll work for bear. But you want me for free to take your design you didn't bother to look at? Actually, yeah. And hey, Jerry, are you, you want me to take one of my more senior people who knows what they're looking at with probably over 20 years of experience, which means they're expensive. Go through your design and document every single opportunity for design for manufacturability. But well, every time I do this, and I give you a list, you fight me on every oh, single on, item saying, can you just build it the way it is? I mean, he's, he's my dog, but he's really picky on stuff. I don't understand why he's so picky. It's, <laughs> it's, gonna, it's gonna impact can he just our build you. It? With jazz hands. Can he just build it? I mean, so, uh, so, so has anybody sent out DFMs 
for, to the fabricators and they make a list? Is it every time you said, we will do everything you found? Yeah. Thank you, and we'll put them in, or like, I'm already behind budget on time. Could you just build it the way it is? How, yeah. how often does that happen to you guys? Because this happens to us. Or we give the DFM, we get the actual order, they go, they did not change one thing we found. You know why? Because we're middle arrow. We already scheduled in three spins, four spins, so we'll just catch the next time. Just build it right now. We'll catch that the next time. And usually it never gets so, fixed. The only thing I ask for doing DFMs is please check the data you have. Look at the documentation and make sure it's in the design before you send it out to DFM because we'll find stuff the drill counts off. They didn't fix the draw, they didn't update the drawing. They just sent the new Gerber data with a new drill file. Or they changed the impedance table, but nobody checked that the impedance table now is different lines and different layers. And then we're like, okay, you don't have this, you don't have that. And so DFMs are, are time consuming, and when they're incomplete, we'll get stuff, to run a DFM, and go, there's all dead end traces all over the bar. Oh, we're not done designing it. <laughs> why am I doing a DFM? I can't. Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest thing is when we're asking for DFMs, and our project is maybe 30% done, or maybe 40%, and we're asking him to check, we're wasting his time, because chances are, we're gonna change that data. I mean, that, that's reality. Or, or the worst thing is we do a bunch of DFMs. We do a good job. We document it, and then you give the order to somebody else. <laughs> that that never happens, does it? We don't, give, we don't do that. They were cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're saving him for the production run, am I right? They, they do just production. And what I always would like is a little forgiveness. That when I finished a DFL, and we've covered it, and we have all agreed, and we've done all the great stuff to work together, and then we actually get the order to go, oh shoot, I missed that. Um, I found something at the roller red when he because it. That's when people just start losing their minds. But it's his fault. He should have caught it. It was for free. He should have caught it. It was for free. <laughs> so it's just kind of a funny joke with DFMs. Um, what could help us as fabricators is that you just check all the work. Because all those things we find, you're going to have to fix it anyway. But if you fix it before we get the set, there's a greater chance that revision will be locked in and does not have to roll. And, and then we're off to the races and running. And play fair as you wear as If we do the DFM for free, come on. Give us the order. Right. I mean, in the end, I mean, that's yes, it. Yeah. Does somebody raise their hand? Would you recommend taking a company that does just DFMs? Because you could. You're, giving them, you're giving them the board of saying, here, find issues, and they're going to come back and find issues because that's what they're getting paid for. Right. But you'd also have to understand the board shop, you're going in their, their capabilities. And they should also be aware of class levels. When you're analyzing this thing, if you said class three, uh, this is a class three build, you find out you did not design this to class three. Um, then we, we have to go back and say, you either have to redesign it, change the compliance requirement, what would you like to do? Most people, well, I, it's fine, and it's one of the slides coming up. But if you use an outside service, that's great. Make sure that they're very com uh, knowledgeable on, on the requirements like 6012, 6013, or 6018, because then they're looking to make sure your board is going to meet those compliances. This producibility levels vary from feature to feature and fabricator to fabricator. Yeah. Let us tell us about that. So when you design a board and you put on a drawing, you're supposed to tell us the producibility level. And that tells us how complex it is. Everybody just throws letter C, which is the highest complexity. Whether it is or isn't, just C. And then it allows you to use all the smallest spacing and the tightest requirement. Level A means it's going to be a cheap board and anybody with a black and decker drill. We want the board. highest quality and the cheapest price, isn't that? I mean, and so that, that, that's the gold one too. So B is like um, would be something that's easy to build, but it's not very challenging. But somebody who's on their game. And then C is like they really have to know, have controls in place. There'd be an AS ninety one hundred facility, uh, ISO nine thousand. You know, they have systems in place. So when you have somebody who does that, make sure they they. They understand the requirements and also the requirements of the board shop. They're going, not all board shops, even the seven we have, there's some that will refuse to use a drill bit size below X. But the other one's like, oh, we use four all the time. And so you got to understand where is that product uh, going to be built at. But like I said, just check your documentation before you send it to us. Um, we like the customer relationships. But every time we document that stuff, it's, it can be hours of documenting all the findings. Oh. My friend here calls and says, I'd like to put all four of these boards on the same panel. <laughs> we don't have short We, we never do that, do we? And yeah. It's like, all right, 
So I have a 12 layer, a 4 layer, a 6 layer, and a 10 layer, and I'm supposed to... For the four layer, what layers do I put those four layers on the 12 layer? I only want to pay for one sheet of FR4, man. Come on. Do, do I put it like this? And then I'll take the sixth layer and do something like that. Just optimize it. Yeah, but I got to copy layer two for, to layer two on there, but layer three to layer 11 for the first one and the sixth layer. I got to copy pretty layer. It's straightforward, Jerry. It's not straightforward. By the way, you're changing polarities between your, one of the threes and the other one, the four. So I can't just. I don't even know if the impedances work out. So, usually when somebody says like that, I just go, no, I'm not doing that. It's just, I have to do four inputs and then I have to move layers that two is two on that one and three is 11 on that one, four is 12 on that one. We're gonna screw it up. I can't, tell you, up. I can't tell you how many times in my experience, I've had double E's come to me and they want that. They, they push really hard and they, they're, and they argue to no end. I'm not lying, they argue to no end. They want their three prototypes or four prototypes, and they only want to pay for one panel. And they range from four layer all the way to 18 layer boards. And so, the four layer simplest, with the other one being like uh, HDI, and I, I don't get it. They're understanding why they think they can do this. But are not totally rigid, except in some of our facilities, they are rigid boards. Mm -hmm. I will do different boards on a panel, but it has to kind of make sense. So, in the scenario, this actually happened this week. Customer goes, look, I know you don't like to do it, Jerry, but I have He's a transmit a and a receive board. I go, do you have one of each in your system? He goes, yes, one of each in the system. So you can't build a system with one of them. No. I said, all right, for you, because I like you guys. Because I'm his boy. Yeah. <laughs> I will put the transmit and receive on an array, and there's no X outs, because you can't build the house. <coughs> so I got to ship a complete array that passes, and then I'm willing to put two part numbers in here because it's always going to be the same amount on a number. You see, I, I told you you can do it. This one? Yes, this one I can. I can do this. But like if you get a, a situation where I want 12 of these and three of those. <laughs> so what happens is if we're, let's say we're short on the we three of those and I have to do a remake, then I'll make it all of the 12 extra on the panel that are just going, it's just like, it's logistically just not a smart thing to do. I would just build 12, the, the one part on one part uh, tool and the other one on a different, and then I'd just monitor my overage. So there are cases where it'll work. There's other cases where like, no, I'm not even doing it. Um, when you have uh, multiple arrays. Okay, any, any questions about that or trying to fit multiple? It works really good for double-sided boards. Really good for 062 double-sided. You can do that all day long. And there's companies that, that thrive handsomely doing that kind of work. But once you get the higher layer counts, it doesn't work. The next one. Uh, okay. Ring, 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 ring. Hello? Hey, Jerry, I, I sent over some data for you, and, and you know what? I, I realized that uh, it didn't go through the silk screen cleanup phase. Can you, is there a way you can you know, clean it up for us? Well, you need it. Uh, you put an indicator thing in the wrong spot? Uh, let me look at the data, but hold on. Hey, what do we do with the polarity? Polarity should be good. Huh? We, we didn't touch it during cleanup, did we? Uh, I think the polarity is in the wrong spot. Can you put it in the right spot? That's an easy fix. I can do an easy fix like that. I can just pick it up, move it to the other side, and I can fix it. So it's great. No problem. Yeah, just look at the schematic. I mean, uh, we we schematic. Schematic. just look at the schematic. I don't we schematic. Data, didn't we? Uh, no, we don't. We wouldn't know what to do with schematic. We need the intelligent data. You no, should no. have everything. We don't do assembly, man. We're just a Gerber solder mask and no, legend come on, and drill. Mm. No, sorry. Hey, I, I bought beers last time. I mean, you can buy me a lot of beers, but I still don't understand how we're here assembly drawing. <laughs> All right, man. Do what you can. Oh, by the way, we found something in your design. What's that? Uh, your designer put the legend text on the pads. <laughs> no, no, we didn't no, do that. Yeah, he did. Yeah. You put like D1 is right on the Hold back. Hold on, let me check. I mean, that never happens. I mean, we, we're, we're good at cleaning that stuff, aren't we? And they didn't pick up on our DRC, but he get a DRC error on that. Did we? I don't know what's there. I don't know what you, did, did you turn it off? Did you turn the DRC on? Uh, you know, chances are uh, it went overseas and yeah, it did. Oh, did I say that out loud? <laughs> so, um, I mean, we could just clip it, but it, the D1, the text is going to be gone. So, um, we also, this reminds me of that other part number that we're building for you. Oh, no. That um, the text is right reading from the top, but it's the bottom legend. 
Would you flip it? Well, if I flip it, it's just going to the other side of the board. No, just, I mean, just put, just flip the board over. You should be able to flip the board over. No, 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 no. The no, silk no. screen should the, be good. The, the silk screen has to stay in the same spot and mirror where it's located. If I mirror the layer, it just goes from left to the right side of the board and the right side to the left side of the board. Your, your legend, which will now be right reading, is not on the right side of the you, board. You, you, I can't fix it. It's, it's not a word processor. <laughs> it's just lines. That's for, to us, it's just lines. It makes R1, but it's just lines. So this happens oftentimes, and it always ends up the same. Well, can you fix it? Nope. Well, just mirror it. Uh, no, it mirrors to the opposite side of the board. That doesn't work. I go, you can fix it, but you're going to have to go in and flip in your design data all the locations. You know what? Just send it mirrored. Okay, just hold it up to a mirror when you're trying to read the text on the finished board. Every time, they never fix it, and then they usually have it fixed on the next revision. So this is this is like a major so screen fix. We can't fix it. It's, it's going to have to go back to you. And this gets missed because when we in CAM at a board shop are looking at the text, it's just right reading. Our brain goes, the text is right reading. It's correct. And when you look at the bottom so screen, you're supposed to go, this should be wrong reading, and I can't read it because it should be mirrored. And so it's a, just an easy miss, and it goes. Usually the so screen guy goes, hey, "This text is backwards." And, and Jerry, but I, I heard that fabricators really don't like dealing with so screen because the board can physically be good, but because of so screen, it can get rejected. Is that is that true? Uh, you can. You can run into some situations where somebody puts so screen on immersion silver, and then it's white uh -huh. on silvery metal, and they can't read the text. Yeah, that, you know, that happened to the last board we did, and, so, you know, you really screwed up on that. I mean, I don't understand why you didn't make the silk screen. You, you, you the said color. legend white. What you no. need to do. Well, we, we, give you, we give you the allowance to change. We give you a... No, 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 no. The standard uh, in IPC is white legend, unless you say otherwise. Now, what you could do is say contrasting color. Then it, the onus is on us to make sure if it's silver and I'm putting legend on there, I better be black. So, if you have legend, on a white or almost white surface finish, just ask us to use a contrasting color. We have black. We even have blood red. It's kind of cool. I mean, in general, does the water, do you guys color the, what is, what's the typical colors that always, your solder mask? Is it green? Is it, what do you guys use? Green, black? What are the, the main colors? Green, blue, red. Any exotic colors? White, yeah. purple. Mm -hmm. White. I, I've seen white with black lettering. It looks really good, like paper. Oh, that, that's, a, that's an interesting point. So if you need a white LED uh, solder mask and to backlight indicator lights, there is a white legend that reflects light like massively. Wow. Um, it's got like a, something in, the, in there and it just almost fluoresces back. So like if you're in a display cockpit or some display panel and you need the indicator lights to really come out to the humans, there's white legend, a white solder mask, and then there's like illuminate, I think it's L-E-W, um, white solder mask for illumination uh, from tile. It looks really awesome when it's used. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Put that All right, let's go next. The next one's my favorite. Oh, yeah. Hey, ring, ring, ring. Hello, hey, the quality department at the board shop. Hey, Jerry, you know what? Uh, these boards don't have solder mask. I have exposed copper. I got exposed, all my external layers, the copper's exposed. I don't understand what the hell happened. Exposed copper where? On the external layers, well, top and bottom. On the solder mask? Or the solder mask? Or? Yeah, I mean, you guys you guys have gotten boards where it looks like there's no solder no, no solder mask on the on the tray, so I need a copper. Send me a picture. Oh, this? Oh, yeah. So Yeah, are you, are you looking at it? So, yeah. Dude, you guys messed up. No, right? no, 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 it's not exposed copper. What do you mean it's not exposed? Yeah, that's not exposed copper. That's just thin legend on the pad. And then we did enig afterwards. Oh, so there's copper. So there's solder mask there. Well, there is. It just gets thin at the edges. Uh -huh. And you see, because if it was exposed, you would have enig. But it's not. So when you get to tax or solder mask, and then you've done the surface finish, it gets infinitely thin. And then the, the surface finish won't go on there because you have this epoxy ink that's been cured on there. And everybody freaks out. This also happens on vias. I don't know how many of you guys have done this. You see a via and it's all coppery color as it bends in. Oh my God, I got exposed copper. No, that's just 
the solder mask gets thin as it goes down the hole, it's still covered with solder mask. Oh, I, if I see copper, I go, if it was copper, it would have an e-neg at this point, because it would have been exposed. Have oh, any of you guys seen that? Right at the knee of the hole. So well, once a year, we'll get somebody, the board's got exposed copper at the knee of the hole. And I said, it's a solder mask. So as you get close to the edge where ink gets pushed out, it gets infinitely thin. And it just, you can see the copper underneath, especially with solder mask or bare copper. Um, and you do even, you, you can see it there, especially with um, solder mask, you have a uh, solder mask defined pads, you'll sometimes you'll see that. So we just wanted to share that with you that when you look at around the edges, why, why does it look like it's copper? It's just the legend's just getting thinner and thinner and thinner, or the solder mask is getting thinner and thinner and thinner. All right, uh, so I'm gonna start off with this one and just explain that when you do a stack up, there's actually a rule saying, make your stack up symmetrical. Our stack ups are always symmetrical. We don't make mistakes. Unless you give it to us anyways. Unless you do it in an RF board. Um, <laughs> so these are some of the scenarios that actually happened to us. Hello, Neff, or uh, Steph? <laughs> What's up, dog? Uh, you gave me a 25 layer PCB with a Yeah, dude, we killed him. It took us forever to get that board done. Yeah, but in your design, you've got a core with signal on top and plane on bottom in the entire stack up. What was your original stack up that was 18 layers? We just added some layers. I know, I know but you gotta, you gotta have a symmetrical stack up. You know, all the power planes on the bottom and signals on the top, this thing's gonna warp like a potato chip. Warp, what do you mean warp? It's gonna warp because the copper where the plane's at, the, the, where you etched off the signal is gonna bow up and you put all Balance the, the copper for me, come on, man. But when you put all 12 layers, it's just gonna follow that bow and we're gonna end up with some bad results. These are real situations that happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So try to epoxy fill something that's not flat or laser drill that something won't lay flat. So these are just un stack ups that are not symmetrical. Oh, potato chip. Yeah, and my favorite. That actually split down the middle. So that's bowed up. It's between the drill machines and we try to force it down on the drill pins because we have four slot tooling and it split from the top to bottom. That is over a thousand dollars of raw material. And it just kind of kept on this thing. It just, it, this is in sequence, the first sub and it was unbalanced. If you look, it's nice and flat. We're on track, everything's going good. We did the next lamination cycle, more unbalanced, it's, uh, it's starting to pull, but I'd be okay. And then at the end, all we did was add pre-prank and foil to one side of the board, and that's what happened. It just lifted off and became non compliant So unbalanced constructions, it's... You did it, that because they told you you had to? Yeah, this is a, it was a military program, and it was just it was really critical. And, uh, and you took and, the order anyway. Yes. No, this this was the, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Oh, well, by the way, we eventually just said no. We're not building this thing. They went to somebody else. They built by by the thousands, and then they were just. I was bring. I was tempted to bring a board just to show you you can bend boards. They got caught, and then put the whole program under the two years behind. Oh. So they redesigned. This ended up getting redesigned. When I was doing them to the redesign, different. Uh, actually, we're building those boards now. It's like five years, five or six years. Yeah, I was doing some work at L3Com, and we had uh, hybrid boards that were FR4 and Rogers material. And right when they came off the line, the first thing you had to do was put stiffeners on them because they'd been, and the stiffeners would never come off because if they did, that board would do just that. But you know what, Steph? I got a solution for you. It's yeah, a same, man. All right, same amount of cores. There's still 12 cores. But what I'd like to do is mirror the bottom half where you see the text where it's mirrored. I've mirrored those. So now I got a symmetrical top matching a bottom. So that will balance out. We'll just add a 26th layer. We'll put a laser via and connect. You still have a connection from two to bottom. Same thing. But now I didn't change the amount of lamp cycles. It's still two. It's a balanced construction, so it's going to be flat. But Jerry, I already released my design in the I system know, you're, on you're, Mill you're, Arrow, dude. You gotta change that. I told you about you're that. You gotta change that. Um, it's the uh, same amount of cores. It's gonna be pretty much the same cost, but it's a buried sub. 
on your original one, I don't X layer 25 until I put 1 to 25 together. So I can't tell if the drill 2 to 25 is any good until the final. But on the 26th layer, when I get finished from 2 to 25, I can electrically test and know the sub's good. If not, I can just remake some more. Or the other way, I have to wait to the very end. Put a laser via, Bob's your uncle, it's flat and all the connections. And really no extra time other than the laser drill. So I think the key takeaway here is Get with your fabricator from the very beginning. Don't toss garbage over the wall and expect him to produce gold. That's that's the core. That, that's at the root of this right here. So we're going to kind of speed these uh, scenarios along so we can get done uh, at one. Ah. Um, hello, Steph. What's up, my brother? Um, I got a job that you called out on layer 10 impedance, and it's a ground plane. <laughs> uh, did I get the right data? Is your drawing not up to date? Did you move the impedance to different light? What, what, what's going on here? We never, we never go without validating the fab drawing versus our true data. We always get that right, am I right? We, uh, we never had impedance, impedance on layer 10, it's a plane. What do you want me to do? <laughs> well, can't you just build it? Just just build it as it is. Ignore it, and then your source inspector, where's the impedance for layer 10? Oh, come it's on, on the drawing, dude. They're going to check. That's another change. I can't, I can't afford to do another rev change in the, in the cycle. So you can update the PO and say disregard the impedance on layer 10, but we have to have some documentation that says we don't have to comply to it. You either have to make a new what about, drawing. What about, what about my canvas on layer 8? Do you have, is that, you have that impedance there? Yeah, but your drawing doesn't match that. you got a source inspector who's going to look at this and it's got to match the, the impedance reports we create. Do you want me to say that layer eight is layer ten, and then? Well, you know, we had that we had that on the preliminary drawing. Can't you just use that the preliminary drawing that no. I gave you? No, not with your military guy. No. So this happens a lot, and they usually just tell us ignore it. Like, no, we can't ignore it. You're gonna have to update your drawing. If it's a commercial guy. Yeah, just red line. <laughs> but uh, this this thing here does come up. So if you check your tables, this is that documentation check check. If you save impedance on layer ten, make sure it's on layer ten. Make sure it's the right size. Because sometimes they're like, mm, it says impedance is a little four mil conductor, but all we have are fives. So are those supposed to be impedances? Or they just disregard it altogether? So I think the work. simple thing is, our tools are powerful today. I don't care what tool you're using. Our tools will tell you what traces you have on which layer. Validate your fab drawing to what your true data is. I mean, that's, that's, that's the biggest takeaway, I would say. Okay. I think I have to call <coughs> Steph on this one. They have... GDNT datums B and C on the side of the board. They have a profile of 10, and then they're calling a hole with a true position of four on edges that could be 10 mil ranged. How do I hold the true position four if the edges can be plus or minus five on two sides? Oh, there's an edge launch. He wants that hole to match the edge launch. So, okay, let's call. Steph. I gotta talk to you about your. Uh, What's up, man? What's well, up? Your drawing calls out your datums B and C on the side of the board. Are you lining up the board to the chassis uh, precisely? Well, or using two just, and just do what the drawing says. I mean, well, oh, okay, but you guys helped us with the drawing. No, 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 not when it came to datums. No, uh, your datum should not be the side of the board with the uh, profile of ten and a hole that's four true position. What are you talking about? So, so GD and T. I, 15 years ago, I didn't know how to spell GDT until I got in trouble. My mechanical guy says GDT doesn't apply to PCBs. Oh, but well, they do for your edge launch. You bought a Southwest, a microwave Southwest uh, edge launch connector. That's a precise location to the edge launch. That needs a local datum, not the side of the board. So what I you know I didn't so good in that GDT class I took in that PCB design easy. class. So Damn. let me recommend this. Why don't you make the bottom left corner of your data, make that data B, right? And then where you're critical at, you can have a true position six there, maximum material condition, and then do that true position of the edge launch to those holes, referencing the local data of D and the local data of C, I can hold four there. I can't hold four across a PCB. So. I would tell you GD and T, I'll be surprised. I, I, I am surprised how many Designers are designing boards that really don't understand GD and T. It's it's amazing how many of us need to take a class. And I, I had my hand slapped early in my career from a designer who looked at my drawing and says, "You have no clue what you're doing." And it was one of my longtime mentors who said, "You need to take a GD and T class." How, how many people have taken a GD and T? 
G, D, and T class. Okay, good. You should take the classes. Um, the board shop, we made all our quality in our um, CAM department take. And then we ask questions like, you asked for a GD and T of four. I was just rubber stamping documents. And it's like, we can't hold that. Even if we put it on, measured it, took it off, put it back on a CMM member machine, and use those data, local data, we, we couldn't repeat it. Because true position four is really barely any movement. And I go, you're gonna have it. So, how many people have gotten a call about GD and T on their design? Everyone's afraid to raise so, their hand. So, and that, and that's, that's normal. Board shops don't, we don't care. We, do, we ignored these things for years until we get in trouble. And then you learn like, no, your GD and T doesn't make, like, why did you have a GD and T of four for this edge watch? Well, because that's the tightest component. So I use that with the global datums. No, 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 not the global datums. You gotta have local datums for that local connector because it's, the control box is a relationship. It's a relationship between what is matters to each other. So you give local datums because that's a relationship with that edge launch connector or whatever you're doing. So when you have critical things that have to be edge cut or something, what is that relationship? It's not global datums typically, okay? So you have to use global datums as necessary to fit a chassis, but when you have connectors, it's usually alignment hole to the lands within that connector. That relationship has to be defined by local datums. So, and this, this happens a lot. People get mad at nobody else ever complains about our GDT. I go, yeah, well, we can build it and not measure and tell you that, and then, and then just ship it in. So I had one customer, they had, they had this material that just stretched all over the place, and they kept on every year or two, they would change the GDT from 14, which is huge, because of material stretch, to six, and they go, you gotta put it back. They go, well, the, your competitors don't complain about this. I go, are you guys measuring the boards? I go, no, don't ask us that question. <laughs> I go, I go, are you guys forcing these, because they're like doilies, are you forcing these things over your tool holes? I go, yeah, pretty much on every board we're, we're having to stretch to get them on the tool holes. I go, then it's not holding the true position six because you wouldn't have had that problem. The reason why you're stretching and pushing and trying to get them in there is because it's stretching all over creation. You need the bigger gd &T. So use it, apply it wisely as necessary. The gd &T this customer had was on a fiducial on the breakaway rail. That was critical. Dude, it's irrelevant on the actual system. Why are you making me throw boards away for a measurement that is absolutely irrelevant? So again, exactly. use it wisely in the relationship. Oh, Jerry? Yes. Can I have a sentence, if you please? I'll be sure. This yeah. was a, a couple of people had asked this. Your CAD datum, your zero, 0 is not what they're talking about, okay? They're talking about three mutually perpendicular datum points to establish X, Y, and Z Correct. measurements. Because all your data is, is true position data. So don't confuse the two. The first A position establishes Z axis. Mm -hmm. And then two, two holes, okay, establish X and Y movement, whereby now they can apply all your CAD and Z data. Yep. Thank you. And also, MMC, my friend, maximum uh -huh. material condition. What that means is like if you have the tightest hole, this is the tightest condition, but if you do plus or minus three and I drill the middle of the tolerance, then it's three mils loose, right? Because the bottom of the tolerance is three mils smaller. So. Jerry, what are you talking about? Man? So, okay, that's a good question. So, <laughs> if you call out GD and T of six. Chinese? A GD and T of six, that means in the, any case scenario, whatever drill size in the tolerance, it has to hold a true position of six. But if you give me a drill, that's plus or minus five, and I drill right at nominal, it's got five, mil, five mils of extra slop. So maximum material condition means at the smallest the hole could be, the minus five, it has to be true position six up there, right? Mm -hmm. But if I drill it nominal and it's a minus five, that means I get five on top of the six. G, D, and T to pass is 11. It's easy to pass it. So, yeah, it's easy money. So when you build boards, it's like, I have a board this big and the gd and is six, and we'll say, could you give us maximum material condition? Because you got a plus or minus four, that'll give me a bonus of four, because everybody loves a bonus. Mm -hmm. So, if you hear a board shop ask for maximum material condition, that's because you have this range. If we do in the middle of the range, I get bonus, and it will fit in your chassis because of the extra gap that, that's built in because of the tolerance. So, understand gd and Maximum material condition, it's our friend. We ask for it, that's why we're asking for it. I'd also recommend that 
at least once, maybe once a year or twice a year, you get with your fabricator, send them your fab notes and say, do me a favor, review these and redline them. Give me some, what you, uh, am I stating this correctly in these notes? Uh, even, you know, before, ahead of time, before you produce your data, bounce it off them to make sure that you're not, you're not even contradicting your own self in your notes because that never happens. Yeah. All right, next one, this is a true story. This really happened. So, Jerry, ring, ring, Jerry. Hello. You sound kind of urgent. Yeah, you know, I, I, I got our boards in and... Did you like two, them? Two, Jerry, two of the holes are missing. What, what two holes? The two hole, the two non-drill holes, the two in the center. The mounting holes. You, you got the data I sent you, didn't you? I mean, I sent you the, the latest data. Did, were the two holes that are missing in your drill file? And we put them on the drawing. You mean all those symbols over there, the gazillion symbols? There was two yeah, extra ones? That's what I told you. You remember, we had that phone call. You remember, actually, you know what? When you and I went to lunch, I was telling you about it, and I told you. I know, but you did know, you put any solder mask clearances or plane clearances for those locations? You said you'd take care of that for me. No, 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 no that's your design. That is my guy. So it's not in the drill chart, so I don't know there's extra holes. It's not in the drill file. And there's no clearances in the solder mask or the plane layer, so if I actually drilled it, you would have had exposed power and ground in the board. Jerry, but that's not the data I wanted. <laughs> so in this, the purpose of this whole board that this actually failed was they were just adding two holes. And the guy just put the symbols in the drill pattern and said, how did you miss those? <laughs> he, really, that's all he did was take his drill dry and draw them with red on his drawing. <laughs> so they're not actually that's a real scenario. This is a real scenario. This actually happened. Everything we have been showing you today though. has been a real scenario that Jerry has seen. Wow. So everything today is is real world stuff. That's why Jerry has great hair. Mm -hmm. yes. One side. One side. One side. That's why he's my dog, man. He hooks it up all the time. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next one is I get a design. It's got a 52 mil pad. Finish hole's 38. That gives me a six mil uh, annual ring per side. If it's I drill the finished hole size, that's not going to work. And it's Come tin on, lead. You're Batman. It's tin lead reflow. So when we do annual ring and check for annual ring internally, it's the drill size. It's not the finished hole size. You have to take into consideration the drill size I have to use, and then set your annual ring. So in this scenario, this happens a lot. They, they ask for a 38 and it's tin lead, so we go six over because tin lead gets in the hole, makes the hole even smaller. Except in the case of a finished 38 hole that I want to drill six mils bigger, that drill bit doesn't exist. And guess which way we go? We always round up, so the pins fit in the hole. So all of a sudden, I round up another 1.3 mils on top of the six, and all of a sudden the annual ring goes down to three and a half, it's like this board is not even class two let alone not class three. So the thing, the design adjustment, well, how am I supposed to calculate how much annual ring I'm supposed to have in my design? There's actually a rule, and it's easy. I say, yep, B, C. So God this, this is that producibility thing we talked about earlier. So if you design to producibility, you're saying that you're gonna add that factor in. If you said producibility B, you have to use that much extra factor. But the, this is how it goes. A is the maximum diameter of the finished hole. Maximum diameter of the finished hole. So if you say 10 plus 3 minus 10, that number's 13. It's not 10. If you allow etch back and you say you can etch back 2 mils, you're supposed to, no one ever did. No one's ever added the, two, the etch back allowance in there. But you're supposed to factor in the etch back because you're getting that much closer to conductors. Okay? So that you have to have the pad size. B is your annular ring requirement. So if you do class three, that's one mil per side, so it's two, right? So you take the maximum drill size, 13, and the B a case, right? Plus two, that's 15. Then you add the producibility level, C, with all these favorite modifiers. The red one underlined is my favorite. So if you have more than one ounce copper, you add two to the pad size. When you added all that stuff, it's a factor. Two ounces is very easy. So yeah, if you have more than eight layers, you add two. And the bottom one, if a drill goes through two, a previous sub, you add two to it. So remember that scenario I told you about the customer with the two blind subs? 
And the final, we applied that rule to the final one and went from 25% to 88% because we applied the rule. It is designed, he had 7,000, seven and a half mil drills of copper. That's why the yields were so low. When he was done, he had only 24 locations at eight. And I go, I'm willing to take that risk from 7,000 to 24. And the yields went up to, to from 25% to 88%. So this is an IPC, 2221, 2222. The rules on how to determine your annual ring. Do we do less than what this? What you calculate? All the time. But we're like, hey, can you do tangency? Can we do this? Can we do that? Or we'll look at it and go, oh, that's that's no problem. We're like, no, that's a cap lamp. That stuff moves around a lot. We're, we're going to want the bigger end of the ring. So we'll look at this. We'll help you through it. So Jerry, Jerry, guess what? I don't understand why I'm only getting partial deliveries. What's, what's going on here? And late. And they're late. And late. They're others. Well, that's because... You didn't follow the one rule underlined in red in your design. Well, I mean, what are you talking about? We, well, we had no DRCs. Well, we, uh, we, we always run DRCs on our designs. You removed the non-functional pads and then routed the traces. What's wrong with that? Well, I mean, the drill. I, you guys removed non-functional pads. The, the drill, the <laughs> copper trace to trace, trace to pad spacing is not the same as a drill to a conductor. It is the requirement of the annular ring and then the space as if there was a pad there. So in your design, you gave me a seven and a half mil drill on the third lamination Let cycle. Let me check my data, hold on. Oh shoot, we, we, my design removed the pads, removed the pads during the design, not generating outputs. So my spacing applies to the whole. So oh, shit. let me share with you what's been happening with the boards we've been scrapping. Whoops. That's the exact location from the design. This program got canceled because they didn't design with a non-functional pad in, route the traces, and then removed it afterwards. They had a seven and a half mil drill to copper. They had a three layer, it was 28 layers. They had a three layer sub, and then add another cap core on top of that. Those things moved around, and then we put all the other layers. We were just getting killed. And it was just at the end, is when we, we, we acquired a division, I looked at the design, I go, we're not building this anymore. They go, well, what do you mean? You've been, you, and the lid of this, goes, it took us two years to get boards that were good. I go, see, that was the problem. You should have noticed that something was wrong if it took two years for something to come out good. If it was designed well, it should just come out. So this is an actual rule. Internal land should not be removed to make room, make enough room to wrap circuits. They even meant that to keep back distance. I always want to be like uh, Clint Eastwood and uh, El, um, Grand Torino, stay off of my lawn. That <laughs> annual ring, that distance belongs to me. Okay, so we get good yield. So uh, this is a good rule to know and apply. It makes it tougher to design, but the rules are safe. Remember, 25% yield to 88% yield. Oh my gosh. Can I catch a bus? An A bus. How many people know what A bus stands for? A bus is a term with an IPC. Is that a set of signals coming out of my FPGA? No, 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 it's not a set of signals in your data. What impedance do they require? Uh, an A bus? Well, it depends on what you put on the print, and I agree to it. So A bus. What are you talking about? Okay, well, let me, let me uh, elaborate. A bus, A A B U S, is a term with an IPC document. It means as agreed between user and supplier. So when you say, I have an impedance of 4 mil line and I want 50 ohms, you're saying, I, this is what I want, and I look at the print and quote it and say, I will meet that requirement. That's an A-bus condition. We have defined what you want and what I agree to build. So A-bus. So this is one of my favorite A-buses in um, 6012. That if the copper is 18 mils under 10,000 feet or more, I can't have halo in any closer than four mils from the conductor. It's a violation, non-conforming, it's dead. But how many people use ESD rings around the boards? How many people use like an eight mil space for the ground to the edge of the board? Uh -huh. Zero? Yeah, 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 yeah. So eight, 10, six. Well, what happens is you've now not designed to the rules. And so haloing can go all the way to the conductor. We have finished boards, stacks, and we're going, oh, there's haloing next to the conductor. Well, they didn't design it to the standard. So that's when we call you guys and say, 
hey, Steph, could you find it in the kindness of your heart at this point to have an A-bus condition to allow haloing to your conductor? Come on, Terry. Well, I know it doesn't, I know you don't want it, but you didn't design, there's a rule. So we need an, we need an agreement. I'll tell you what, you put three prototypes on, on one FR sheet, FR4 sheet, <laughs> and I'll give it to you. It's double-sided. So, so what happens is- Work with me, come on. As we become more knowledgeable about the standards and we see that there's an A-bus condition that will occur at the finish of the build, when we do DFMs, when we do our DRC to build your boards, we might ask, you might hear people say, hey, can we have an A-bus condition for haloing on the edge of the board? Do you have ESD rings around the board? It's closer. There's a chance of halo when your inspectors will go, oh, that's rejectable. It gets too close. But the problem with A-buses and there are 39 of them in IPC 6012. Just in that spec alone. That when they occur, then we're asking for you, please, out of the kindness of your heart, could you accept this condition so I can get paid? And we're like, oh, I don't like the way it looks. I know, but we have to agree to something. <laughs> so when you hear about A-bus conditions, as we get more intelligent on applying the rules and ask, we'll explain why it's necessary in your design, but those are A-bus conditions, right? And so when you have something that doesn't mean IPC, but you want, that enforced on your rule, that note becomes an ABUS condition. And when I quote it, I agree to stand up and finish that product to that. Okay, let's finish these, finish these the, that, Yeah, this is the last one, yeah, we're, we're at time. So this is the last one, and this is one of the, uh, the myths I like to put away in the industry. We'll get a design, there's not enough annual ring, the conductor's too close, it's wide, and, and the designer will tell us, well, you're allowed to change the design 20% or two mils. Has anybody ever used that? Yeah, you can just change my design, 20% or two mils. I go, no. He's gotta save me, come on, Jerry. Hook no. Me. I, I can't, 20 mil or 20,000 to, to do this change. You, you gotta help me, man. No, that rule is processing allowance for the fabricator on the lines and pads. Well, that process the data and give me the output. Man. Well, no, but I can't go to the end of the process and go X further. Ends. Come on, come on. So, so this, this, this happens in our industry a lot. People will say, oh, you're allowed to change my design. I know I screwed up, just fix it. You can change it two mils or 20%. No, it's a process window that your board, if you have a five mil line, it could be four mils. That's the process window. But we have people that just change my design, you, you're allowed, not a rule. I've had to go change in, in some of our facilities. That rule cannot be applied in CAN. You cannot change the data. You're allowed to process. So if you ever try to apply the rule, you're not applying it right. It is a processing allowance for the manufacturer, fabricator. And it's also documented in section 3.5.1 and 3.5.2. This is the last one. Same net spacing. You can see on layer one, the green, it's all one big square pad. There's vias and the pads are separate. How many people have in their DRC doesn't check for self? Same net spacing. Just ignores it. On our AOI machines, it doesn't know the difference between the same net or not. So what happens is they'll get shorts between these pads that are too close, like two mils, and then they'll start using these things on your job and what they do if you fix it once that's going to be good all the time every core they run they're going to lean across an EOI table and use an exacto knife to cut out the shorts don't need to be cut and it just consumes time now your core is three mils thick they're cutting and trying to flick off copper they might cut through so if that makes you nervous it makes you a little squeamy just fill it in with copper and connect them all up like that. AOI won't find anything. No one's going in there with the exact tonight. So save that spacing, check it, try to fix it, please. The problem is when we do our DRC checks and we get thousands of same net spacing, there could be a real one and someone's gonna miss it. They're, they're not gonna diligently go and check. The drill goes here, goes to layer one. Okay, that's false alarm. When there's thousands, they go, best of luck. <laughs> and off we go. Last one. <laughs> this, this actually, one more, one more. This, this is the last one. You're killing me, Jerry, you're killing me. Dude, I got, I got this Come design on, and I noticed it's rep B and this is the first time you gave it to me, but you got a non-plated hole five mils away from the plane layer. But it's non-plated. I, I know, but you gotta remember those layers are 
five mils inside of a pad that's acceptable. So that means that layer can shift and be exposed copper inside of a non plate hole. This is a flight board, right? Yeah, it is. Okay, so now you put a fastener in there on power and ground, and you could be one mil away, no one can see it, but calf's gonna go to that fastener and short out out in the field. Calf, what's calf? Copper migration. You have moisture, you have a bias of voltage, copper is just gonna migrate. So I know somebody else built the board, but did they tell you about this? No, it's the first time I've ever seen this. Well, yeah. so do you want to redesign it? Can you just fix it for me? Okay, but it's not, it's not my to design. So what happened was, in this scenario, the customer was going to yank the order from us. They said, well, we'll give it to the other guy because you can do it. I go, no. And I knew the customer, and they have such a matter of experts from friends. I go, no. I go, they go, well, what do you think they did? They probably they grew it, or they shipped you the boards with the copper that close to the edge of the hole. I go, you either have a dangerous situation out on the field in flight, or they've changed your design, and that's it. They go, well, we're gonna probably need to give it to you. They go, so I'm being punished and losing an order because I pointed this out to you? So I got a little, because I was friends with them, I kind of leaned on them, saved the order, and then they- Because I'm his boy. Yeah, so <laughs> it's good to have relationships. That ain't right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, in the end here, so how can we optimize our integration between design and fabrication? The bottom line is, you know, Establish a relationship, you know, you've got to have them at the, at the get-go, you know, you know, with your, uh, bring them in from the very beginning, when you kick off your data, they should be part of your stakeholders. Uh, your external suppliers should be part of your stakeholders from the very beginning, that's, that's paramount. And then, you know, these, there's a bunch of bullets here, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you can read them okay, or because of time if you want, I don't, I can go through and read every one of them. I'll just jump around from, you know, confirming your stack up, come on, that's like 101, you should have that confirmed and locked in before you even start routing traces. Um, but I can tell you how many times in, in my experience it, it's not, and it's usually after the fact, or somebody wants me to look at their design and they didn't compare, especially on rigid flex. I look at 90 degree bends, I'm like, are you kidding me? What fabricator gave you this? And like, well, we haven't talked to anybody, but we're about to give, give it to the fabricator. It's like, it's not gonna work. So, you know, uh, you know generate your industry standard outputs and, and, and and send, and send your corrected versions to your suppliers. So when you just validate your data, take the time to do the appropriate review and don't just rubber stamp and say, yeah, I looked at it. Actually look at your data because, you know, I've been on teams where we did our fair share of screw ups. Uh, drawing and design to industry standard. I mean, IPC standards are there for a reason. We may speak different languages or be in different cultures, but the common language is the IPC standards. So design to the standards because that's what they're being fabricated. That's what they're going to be fabricated. And if you want to bend the rule, the IPC rule in your design, call a fabricator. Ask yes. them, hey, is it okay if I bend the rule here? And they go, eh, yeah, we can handle that. Or like, no, you don't want to do that. Ask us. We'll, we'll provide you the guidance when you need it. Yeah, and if you have a unique or custom uh, um, situation or, or a, a design you're going to do, get with your fabricator from the very beginning so that way you document it appropriately in your drawing. So that way, He's not surprised, and you, you've done it right, so that way it's a smooth transition when you hand off, uh, so you don't get any TQs back, or the technical worries coming back at you. Because it never fails, they usually come when you're on vacation, or nowhere near your laptop. Uh, make sure you have an agreement with your procurement uh, for requirements for delivery and, and your due date. Oh my gosh, make sure that your team understands how many pieces you're getting and, and you're true, and make sure you're, you're in agreement with him, uh, your fabricator. And then, of course, be familiar with the IPC standards. I mean, from the 22, 21, 22, 23, and 60, 12, 60, 13. Make sure you understand or at least have an idea of what's in those, in those, fabrics, those specifications. And above all else, communicate, communicate, communicate. You cannot do that enough. And it's paramount that you constantly communicate with your fabricator. So I hope you enjoyed our, our uh, first ever skit. And uh, I know we're not having Costello, but we tried to. Uh, <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs>